Happy Halloween, boys! Welcome to Herb Corner. Here we are in the Majwal Rainforest National Park in Madagascar. It's like midnight when I'm recording this, but mm, who cares? It's Halloween. I hope you don't mind I'm doing this in my gunk costume. I worked really hard on it, alright? Uh, on theme, let's talk about the Satanic Leaf-Tailed Gecko, also known as the Eyelash Leaf-Tailed Gecko, Fantastic Leaf-Tailed Gecko, and yes, it's fantastic with a PH, uh, and also, also known as Europlatus Fantasticus. Fun fact about their scientific name, Europlatus roughly translates to flat tail in a Latinization of two Greek words, while Fantasticus, as you might guess, directly translates to imaginary in Latin. On that note, the Wired.com article on this species writes, <coughs> The satanic leaf-tailed gecko is one of 14 species in its genus, including the mossy leaf-tailed gecko, which long ago renounced Satan in favor of mosses. Oh my god. These guys are seriously some of my top 10 animals ever. They're so awesome. Look at them. Uh, they get their names mostly from the fleshy horns that's off their bright red eyes. Kind of spooky looking. Oh, but uh, speaking about their eyes, uh, you can tell the species is noctur nocturnal based on the fact that they've got slit-shaped pupils. These eyes are highly sensitive to light and can see better in the nighttime. Uh, do with that information what you will. As with most members of the Europlatus genus, these fellas have an incredibly unique appearance in many different ways. Their colors are super pretty, and that funky little leaf tail, uh, hence the name, right? Yeah. They're actually quite the fragile animal, N not very hardy, and not at all resilient to stress. And yet, they'll often hang, hang around up high in trees, uh, being mostly arboreal, mostly being the key word here. They've also been found on the ground amongst the leaf litter. Along with their excellent mimicry, satanic leaf-tailed geckos are able to flatten their bodies, which makes them look even more leaf-like. Good luck finding these dopies in the wild. Jesus, they're cool. Oh my god. Uh, like most other leaf-tailed geckos, arboreal geckos, or a good lot of geckos in general, except the desert-dwelling ones, of course, they have these interesting little claws that help them cling to all kinds of surfaces. Uh, their fingers have adhesive scales on the ends of them, the signs behind which is pretty interesting. Basically, the adhesive pads are known as lemelae, I think. Uh, lemelae are composed of a bunch of microscopic hairs called setae. Uh, crested geckos, day geckos, and the like all have pretty similar anatomy in this regard. Speaking of those animals, just like them, satanic leaf-tailed geckos don't in fact have eyelids. Uh, crested geckos, day geckos, lichianus, whatever. They don't technically have eyelids. Kind of. A little. It's a bit of a... Well, uh, they've got these little things called spectacles, um, which are these thin, transparent scales right on top of their eyes. They're not movable, so to clean the scales, they have to, like, lick their eyes. Uh, actually so funny. Actually so funny. Uh, satanic leaf-tailed geckos are judged as least concerned by the IUCN Red List, with a, unfortunately, slowly decli declining population. This isn't the best, considering how common it is to export and import them, uh, especially for the reptile trade, <clears throat> but it's better than them being critically endangered, I suppose. Uh, they're mostly found in low-level shrubs and trees, uh, pretty close to the ground, yeah. although prone to climbing, uh, it's rare to find them that high up off the ground. Disregard what I previously said. Uh, no matter the height, the biomes they reside in are very, very, very wet. Just consistently. Uh, here's a fun little fact that'll be important later on. Satanic leaf-tailed geckos uh, display quite interesting and a little subtle sexual dimorphism. Uh, there are a few exceptions to this rule, but genu uh, generally, males of this species have tails resembling a leaf that insects bit into, whereas females typically have tails resembling a freshly fallen leaf. Uh, this is kind of funny to me, considering bite marks on a leaf are a pretty unnoticeable and subtle thing. Uh, and for this trait to have evolved over the years in this species is kind of wild. Hey, uh, Quinn from the future here. I'd like to note that I've got some speculation on why this might be the case. Uh, so I was reading up on a on differing behavior between the sexes of leaf-tailed geckos. Uh, listen to this from the reptophiles. Uh, male sicori I think that's how you pronounce it, tend to have a more bark-like pattern, while females tend to look more mossy. Uh, this is referring to a different species from their same genus, but it brought to my attention the fact that satanic leaf-tailed gecko males and females look a little different in markings as well. 
Um, I think that the differences in tail appearance might stem from the different places they might hang out in, uh, depending on their sex. Maybe females are more prone to hanging out closer to treetops, whereas males are more among the leaf litter. Uh, th this would most definitely explain the fact that some sources say they're terrestrial, while others say they're very much ar arboreal. They might just be confusing the two different genders together. Uh, hence my mixing up my facts a little early on. Uh, but yeah, I th I think females having m more fresh leaf looking tail things uh, makes more sense if they're hanging out among the tops of trees since the leaves around them are roughly as fresh. Um, whereas males hang around the already fallen and decaying leaves with a similarly decaying leaf looking tail. Makes sense? Of course, this is speculation, but I do think that there is a fair bit of weight to this hypothesis. Uh, feel free to give me your input on the idea. Uh, anyway, back to the forest. Uh, also, despite their tail being an incredibly accurate portrayal of a leaf, they still possess the little sticky pad at the end that crested geckos do. Um, the the sticky pad that that they use to cling to like sticks and trees when climbing. Um, it's semi prehensile, semi not as prehensile as a crested gecko tail, but still, they can kind of grasp with it, a little bit. Uh, at least, I think that's what that part is. <laughs> they all have a, have that uh, little part of it that tapers to an end, though nobody has 100% yes or no this claim, so take that one with a grain of salt. A uh, pinch of salt. A teaspoon. Um, uh, take it with salt. Yeah. Uh, additionally, males grow to be much smaller than females, weighing around 5 grams, while females weigh around 9 grams. Uh, additional sexual dimorphism for these guys falls in line with most other geckos. The males usually develop a hemipenal bulge, or as I like to call them, cresticles, because crested, ge crested gecko t you get it. Uh, the hemipenal bulge, as the name would suggest, contains the male's hemipenes. You see, since reptiles have cloacas, or cloacas, I don't care, uh, it means they also have internal genitalia. Fun fact, this, this also makes it so they're anatomically incapable of possessing a bladder. This is generally why lizards love peeing on you so much. Uh, they don't really have a choice. Sad. Uh, here's another fun fact, satanic leaf-tailed leaf geckos, like lizards in general, possess two penises, known as hemipenes. I'm allowed to say that word, right? Uh, hence the name hemipenal bulge. Females don't have a bulge down there, or at least don't have as protruding of one. Uh, geckos in general, I'd say, are much easier to tell the sex of just based on the cloaca alone. Look at the difference. I love that. Uh, of course, uh, cresticles are visible um, on some other lizards, like Galap Galapagos land iguanas, for instance, uh, but in no other types of reptiles are they so obvious. At least none other that I know of. Did I just spend the whole segment talking about reptile bulges? No. Yes. Uh, it's it's educational, alright? The, the satanic leaf-tailed geckos are endemic to the southeast coast of Madagascar, and were discovered in 1888 by George Albert Bollinger. I think that's how you pronounce it. Belgian-British zoologist who's given scientific names to over 2,000 species. Talk about a portfolio. I love this guy. Dr. Bollinger, wherever you are, I hope you are well. Uh, speaking of Bollinger, in his writing about this species, he included a sketch of a specimen he witnessed in the wild. Uh, here it is. As you can see, the gravid female he drew, and yes, that is what they look like when they're gravid, could barely tell, could you? <laughs> uh, is very much lacking in the tail department. She's got a bit of a, um, as they call it, frog butt. Uh, this leads me to believe that, similarly to crested geckos, they drop their beautiful tails when under stress. Uh, it also seems like lacking tails severely hurts their balance and general locomotion. Knowing that, uh, be careful around these fellows, please. <laughs> oh, also, uh, when they're under stress, they like to curl up around their tail, uh, if they have it, uh, to, I suppose, camouflage better. I'm cool. Just a little. <laughs> Actually, uh, on the topic of stress, might as well delve into, uh, delve into their care, right? Uh, if you're thinking about a vivarium for this species, I definitely recommend checking out Reptiliatus' video on the vivariums he did for them. Um, great guy, Reptiliatus is the number one. Uh, link in description. Let's start with the size of the actual enclosure, though. Mm, it's recommended that for a single adult, the minimum would be a 10 by 10 by 20, you know, the Typical exoterra, I'd say, but that is the absolute bare minimum, so definitely consider dedicating more room for your guy, or guys. Yeah, 
co I mean, cohabbing is generally okay, just so long as the enclosure is larger the more guys you introduce. Uh, well, I guess the more girls you introduce. It's not such a good idea to um, house multiple grown males together, since they will most certainly fight. Uh, unless the enclosure size you give them is massive, of course. Uh, though, for housing a trio of fellas, fellas being figurative, we're mostly talking about girls here, uh, it's recommended to give them a 24 by 24 by 48 at minimum. Roughly. Uh, yeah, that's what I'd recommend- uh, that's what's recommended for giant leaf-tilled geckos, but like, just so long as they can find the food you give them, the bigger the better. Uh, especially when talking about cohabbing. Oh, uh, but what kind of food do they go for? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> First off, uh, just know that whatever I'm suggesting for them should be thoroughly dusted with reptocalcium with D3. I mean, they're gonna need it. Look at them, they're all bones. Uh, of course, that does not justify overfeeding. Uh, the best schedule would definitely be every other day, though for young'uns, they can be fed every day. Uh, lucky them. They're carnivorous in the wilds, so a diet of mostly invertebrates is a good idea. If you're thinking about breeding these dopies, then I'd recommend feeding them snails every once in a while. Snails are terrific sources of protein and fats, uh, which is absolutely crucial for tasks as energy-draining as copulating. Outside of snails, uh, waxworms, mealworms, crickets, silkworms, hornworms, dubia roaches are all pretty good pick. Satanic leaf-tailed geckos prefer high humidity and cool temperatures. Uh, depending on where you live, no heat lamp or heat pack is necessary, just so long as the enclosure is, for the most part, around 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 18.33 degrees Celsius, uh, with a humidity level of 65 to 100 percent, they'll be all good. Uh, satanic leaf-tail geckos are also known to be quite finicky and fragile. Because of this, I wouldn't recommend them as a beginner species. Yeah, no, definitely not. Uh, more of a moderate one. Uh, their needs have to be met perfectly, or else they're known to... Mm, excuse my French, uh, drop dead. Uh, this is of course very sad when it does happen. Uh, but thankfully, the only really hard part of their care uh, to keep consistent uh, is definitely managing humidity and temperatures. You could hypothetically leave a water dish for them, but it's really not needed. They're more likely to lick water droplets off the walls after you spray, and yes, you will need to mist at least daily. Either way, whatever water present must be dechlorinated. Uh, with those fragile little bodies, there's no question that they don't have much resist uh, resistance to lead, fluoride, and whatever else is in your tap. Uh, sucks for them, I love sink water! Now on the topic of breeding, there's quite a bit to it, but very little documented on it. Uh, as far as we know, there is no particular breeding season. They mate possibly once a year, and the eggs hatch within 95 days. Females lay clutches of two to four eggs. They do not care of the baby. They do not care for the babies when they come out. Uh, so if you do breed these guys, be sure to do plenty of breeding up on incubation. Uh, because of their previously stated very finicky nature, breeding satanic leaf-tailed geckos is oftentimes risky. Uh, it's pretty stressful for the animals, so sometimes they don't even survive the process. Uh, though just because it is very difficult does not mean nobody's done it. I know uh, backwater reptiles, for instance, sells captive breads, so there's that. Uh, now before we wrap up, here is two truths and a lie about this species. Let's see if you were paying attention. Um, a, the satanic leaf-tailed gecko is sexually dimorphic. B, satanic leaf-tailed geckos are omnivorous, feeding on invertebrates and fruit. And C, the satanic leaf-tailed gecko is known to be incredibly fragile in captivity. Which one is the lie? Feel free to comment down below. Uh, and you better not cheat by waiting for me to tell you at the very end. Come on. Alright, final thoughts time. Uh, these guys are very cool looking, as I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, though their finicky nature brings them down a peg in my eyes, I'd only recommend them to a moderate to advanced keeper. Since there is a decently sized market for captive breads of this species, I think it's alright for you to look into getting one, even if your main intent is not breeding. Uh, though remember, moderate to advanced. Yeah. Uh, 8 out of 10. <laughs> you know. Uh, but I think that's gonna be all for this installment of Her Corner. Happy Halloween, and as always, sources will be in the description. If you're interested in this topic, I recommend looking further into their husbandry or history. If you like what I do and know a specific reptile or amphibian you'd like to see me cover, put it in the comments. Chances are, if you've made it to the end, you're probably like me, hyperfixating like crazy on reptiles. Uh, well, if that's the case, then this is the perfect channel for you. 
Feel free to subscribe since I do these every other week, like the video to support the channel, have a good evening, morning, or afternoon, thank you for listening, watching, whatever, and I'll see you next time. By the way, the lie was answer B. Although they do eat in invertebrates, uh, they are primarily carnivores. Okay, good night.